Trust the Profits Breeders' Cup coverage is brought to you by Play Up Racebook, the most horse player friendly racebook in the industry. Play Up Racebook is always your best bet. I drove all day just to come back to give you my lessons learned from the 2022 Breeders' Cup. Salutations and welcome, friends. I'm your host, Matthew DeSantis. You can find me on Twitter at the handle at Failed to Menace, and I am here to give you a breakdown and lessons learned from what we saw this past weekend at Keeneland for the Breeders' Cup. And of course, I was there on site at Keeneland, my first time ever at Keeneland, my first Breeders' Cup as well. And before we get into the content, I just want to say a big thank you to all of the Trust the Profits fans who came by, said hi told us how much we appreciated uh, the coverage. It just means the world to us to know that all of you out there are enjoying the content that we're putting out. This past weekend was amazing for our channel. Tens of thousands of viewers, hundreds of thousands of viewers over the last month. It, it really has just been incredible to see the ground soil support. We are so appreciative of it, so humbled by it. It makes us want to do more and to do it even better. So trust us when we We'll continue to turn out great content moving forward. But a huge thank you. I cannot say it enough uh, to everybody who came by, said hello, really appreciate it, and honestly, just overwhelmed by the moment. So before we get into that, I also want to say a big thank you to our sponsor, Play Up Racebook. They have been supporting Trust the Profits this entire Breeders' Cup season, and we are so appreciative of them. If you go and sign up and deposit at Play Up Racebook today, you will receive a 50% deposit bonus for up to $250. So make sure to check them out. Go to Play Up Racebook and get started. Well, like I said, we learned a lot this weekend. There was a lot of big takeaways, a lot of huge races. There's going to be some more content we have coming tomorrow, actually, on the channel that is going to be talking a little bit more about each race, what we learned, what we got right, what we got wrong. I always love to do that personally. I love going back and analyzing what did I see that was that I that I kind of suspected, and then what surprised me. That's something that's always important to do. I think it's handicappers. Yes, it's good to have a short memory. It's good not to change necessarily what you're doing, your methods, but it's always good to reflect and always good to think back and, and look at what you maybe got wrong and how that can help inform you moving forward. So we're going to do that for all 14 Breeders' Cup races. Now, today, though, I just want to talk to you about the lessons learned from the weekend. And listen, I drove eight and a half hours from Lexington, Kentucky, back to Northern Virginia and probably got all dressed up again to just to record this. So I had a lot of time to think about what lessons I learned while I was sitting in the car by myself <laughs> with my thoughts on the way back. So here's a few lessons that I think we learned. And there's kind of five big ones that I want us to talk about today. So the first one is that flight line showed he is a historic horse. There was, of course, some debate going into the Breeders' Cup about just how dominant would flight line be would flight line lose there were a lot of people around the track on saturday who were trying to find an argument against flight line we made a video the case against flight line i think one of the things from that video that i think most people understood but some people might not have is it wasn't to say that we didn't think flight line could win or that flight line was not the most obvious winner he was but could you make a case against him could you make an argument against him? And I tried my best to lay out a couple of pointers that I thought might point to some potential vulnerability. But what he proved was truly that he is a historic horse. Life is Good went out and ran his race. And all credit to Life is Good, the connections in Irad Ortiz Jr. Because let me tell you something. After yesterday, Life is Good could have gone to that dirt mile and won that, won that race by 10 lengths. I mean, he could have blown that field away at the dirt mile. He could have had a second Breeders' Cup dirt mile victory to his resume. But they know that that's not going to add anything to his stallion fee. That's not going to add anything to Life is Good's resume. He went to the Classic. He challenged Flight Line in a way that nobody else could. And they ran ridiculous opening fractions. 22-2 and two opening quarter. 45-2 and two opening half. A 109-3 opening three quarters. A 134-2 and two opening mile. Just incredible pace. And as Mike Smith, the jockey of Tabas, said afterwards, 
horses like that are supposed to come back to you, but Flightline simply does not. The margin of victory was the largest in the Breeders' Cup Classic history of eight and a quarter lengths over Olympiad and then closely followed by Taba. And then, of course, Rich Strike closing into that fast pace as well. And then finally, fifth place was Life is Good. Listen, Flightline is a perfect six for six in his career, and he has never been challenged. Flavion Pratt, his jockey, has never has never shown him the whip, has never shown him the crop, has never had to give that additional urging. He was handridden to a 121 buyer speed figure on Saturday. Now, where does Flightline fit in the history of horses? That is for debate. But what cannot be debated is that he is in that discussion. Is he at the top of it? Probably not. By most standards, he's only run in six races. A lot of times people put more credit on horses that run more often, more frequently, have more big races in their resume. Six career races, four grade ones, never been challenged. And it was a perfect way for him to go out on top in the Breeders' Cup Classic, but he definitely deserves to be mentioned in that discussion. When you talk about horses like Ghost Sapper, when you talk about horses like Secretariat or Seattle Slough, Citation, Cigar, these are great horses, okay? He belongs in that conversation of great horses. That's not to say he's the greatest horse. No, of course not. But it's to say that he is a historic horse, at the very least a generational horse. And I think he reflects the type of horse that we are going to see more of, quite frankly, in horse racing. And we're going to get to that in a second. The second lesson learned is that the Europeans treated the Breeders' Cup like their own private ATM. That they went and just absolutely crushed the North American competition as if it was the varsity playing the junior varsity squad in high school football. It was absolutely stunning to watch the European domination on the turf. That's right. The Europeans won six of the seven turf races. And in the only turf race they did not win, which happened to be the turf sprint, which was won by Caravelle, a 42 to one long shot for Brad Cox. They just happened to finish second and third in that race. But when you look across in the turf, finished first and second in the mile, finished first and third in the Philly and mare turf, won that Philly uh, turf sprint, second and third, like I mentioned, juvenile turf, first and second, juvenile Phillies turf, first, juvenile Phillies, uh, juvenile turf sprint, first and second. It's not just that they win, it's that they get first and second and third, or second and third, or first and third. They are so dominant. And here's the real kicker. We did not even get their best. That's the stunning part of all this. We did not even get their best. A horse like Inspiral didn't come over. A horse like Taria. You might say, who's Taria? Taria is the horse that beat Meditate. Who's Meditate? Meditate is the horse that just absolutely rolled the juvenile Phillies turf. So Meditate lost the last two races over in Europe. Taria is a monster over there. They, they didn't even bring her over. So the Europeans are crushing us, and they're not even bringing all of their best. These are some of their best. A horse like Modern Games, great horse. A horse like Meditate, I think, is going to become a great horse. Victoria Road, Silver Knot, these are outstanding horses. All right, Rebels Romance showed a lot of ability in that race. Stone Age showed a lot of ability in that turf race. Tuesday, huge bounce back. So this is, like I said, just a really incredible, really incredible um, you know, fact that we just see all of these horses from Europe just absolutely dominating these races. Huge lesson learned in this spot. Lesson three. Different year, same faces. The big names still showed up on the biggest day in the sport. One of the things that we did on the Trust the Profits is we did a barn tour. I highlighted the horses coming out of about the seven biggest barns from the biggest trainers around the world. Charlie Appleby, Aiden O'Brien, Steve Asmussen, Todd Pletcher, Bob Baffert, Chad Brown, Brad Cox. Okay, I highlighted those seven. Guess what? 10 of the 14 Breeders' Cup winners came out of those barns. Charlie Appleby and Aiden O'Brien, three winners apiece. Ridiculous. 
Also, the fact that Charlie Appleby won three races and his winning percentage at the Breeders' Cup went down is just disgusting. <laughs> it's hysterical that that happened. Todd Pletcher with two. Brad Cox and Chad Brown each with one. Then you look at the other three winning trainers. Bill Mott with two winners. Cody's Wish and Elite Power, both winners. But Bill Mott is one of the biggest names in North American training. So it's not as if it was at a small barn that got these two wins. Bill Mott was actually kind of next on the list. I just ran out of time of doing barn tours. And then, of course, John Sadler with Flightline, Mark Cassie with uh, Wonder Wheel. But listen, those were the big names. They still come out on the biggest days. This is where uh, we, we saw, the, like I said, the biggest trainers showing out on their biggest day. Now, it was a very bad day for Steve Asmussen. And, and I say this uh, in, in great sincerity. Uh, obviously the injury to Epicenter, all of us here at Trust the Profits, particularly Colin Sheehan, was a huge fan of Epicenter. And we are just hoping on a speedy and full recovery for him. Obviously, he's been retired, but uh, the health of the horse right now is the most important thing. Uh, and to see Steve sprinting down the, uh, you know, sp seeing him running down uh, the track to get to Epicenter, uh, to see his face after Jackie Warriors, uh, Jackie's Warriors defeat, I, I that was the saddest moment I think of the whole Breeders' Cup weekend. Was after Jackie's Warrior came back to Asmussen, he just looked crestfallen, and he went up and just gave her a big kiss on the nose. It's a very sweet moment. Joel Rosario got off and just kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, "Wasn't a lot I could do, basically." And you could just tell how much that defeat hurt Asmussen personally. He just, he loves these horses and you could tell he loves Jackie so much. And so that was a tough moment. And then Clary Air, who ran a hell of a race in the distaff, just, I mean, coming up third in that distaff. So Asmussen just seemed like nothing went his way over the weekend. Not a great day for Bob Baffert either. Although, you know, his horses didn't run terribly. He had a big horse that Colin Sheehan's going to talk about in terms of the Derby trail uh, that ran on the undercard of the Breeders' Cup on Saturday. And But he had a couple of other horses that ran second, obviously had Cave Rock running second, National Treasure running third in the juvenile. So it wasn't great, but it wasn't quite as bad as what Asmussen had to go through. And certainly, like I said, at the end of the day, this is about the horses and you wish the best for Epicenter and a speedy recovery. The lesson four is a phrase I don't like, but cheap speed is still speed. And I put cheap speed in, uh, in quotes because I don't like using that phrase. These horses are not cheap. And none of them are cheap. Uh, and that that's degrading to the horse. But it's a phrase that you hear regularly. That when there's a 30 to 1 long shot on the board who likes to run fast early, people say, ah, that's just cheap speed. And sometimes cheap speed can be dismissed. Well, guess what? Cheap speed is still speed. And early speed, even from long shots, challenged favorites big time. We saw it in the juvenile and we saw it in the sprint. Hurricane J absolutely went out and challenged Cave Rock, ran and forced fast fractions and forced Cave Rock further out because Hurricane J was breaking from the inside post. So not only was there early speed ahead of Cave Rock, which he had not seen before, but now there was also speed to the inside of Cave Rock. And Cave Rock had to be out a little wider than he'd ever really had to be before. Had to deal with another challenge to his speed that he had never had to deal with before. Particularly in a juvenile, that's that's a very difficult thing. Then in the sprint, you had a horse like Super Ocho challenging Jackie's Warrior. Now, I don't Jack, Jackie's Warrior doesn't have a lot of excuses, but it's still an example of how that can change the pace setup. And one of the things, admittedly, I even talked about was that there was not a ton of pace in that sprint that Jackie's Warrior should have had a pretty easy go of things up front. And the fact that Super Ocho still managed to wear Jackie out a little bit and didn't have that kick kind of coming for home that you would expect, you know, it's, it showed something there. Now, like I said, I think Jackie's Warrior is maybe not what he was last year, and I think this year's campaign was evidence of that, that there wasn't a lot of challenge to him throughout the year. But still, you know, that early speed from long shots, absolutely can still challenge those favorites. Like I said, you you have to separate from a handicapping standpoint the difference between a horse that might not be there late, but that can absolutely impact things early. So is Hurricane Jay going to be hit the board? No. Is Super Ocho going to hit the board? No. 
but could they absolutely impact who does? Yes. You always have to remember that even on the biggest days at the Breeders' Cup. And then the final lesson learned is retirements will change the face of racing for next year. That's right. In the eight hours it took for me to get from Lexington to Northern Virginia, there were a slew of retirement announcements from across the horse racing industry of some of the biggest names in the sport. Some of these we already knew going in that this was going to be the final race for some of these horses. Others just came out today. But from the announced retirements, obviously Flightline and Life is Good, the two horses at the top, Flightline retiring. The idea here being that there is very little else for him to do. I know some say maybe head over to Maidan. This is a horse that has been handled with kids' gloves. There's not a lot of reason for me to think that anybody was going to be sending this horse over to Saudi Arabia anytime soon. Okay. Um, life is good retiring as well. That's going to really shake up the older dirt division. Why? Because also Epicenter is retiring because of that injury. So now you're looking at that older dirt division and suddenly it's Zandon, Taba, Cyberknife, that, that Cody's wish, maybe at a mile, but but at, you know, in terms of the classic distance, there's not a lot else there. Uh, Olympiad, we'll have to see. I don't think Belmont's made any formal announcement yet on Olympiad. Um, but you also have had the announcement of Malathat being retired. Uh, and so that is going to obviously have a huge impact on that distaff division. Then you look at Golden Pal, Jackie's Warrior, two huge names in the sprint, also retiring. So this is going to really shape up and, and, and shake up, I should say, the face of racing for the next few years because there's got to be a new breed of horses and a new generation of horses to fill some of these very big shoes. These were some of the biggest names we've been talking about in each of their divisions for the last two years. Flightline, Life is Good, Malathat, Jackie's Warrior, Golden Pal, Epicenter. That Those six horses right there took up a lot of ink being written about, took up a lot of people's breath talking about the six of them. And now there's going to be a new crop that comes in. There's going to be more potential retirements in the coming days. The one piece of, I think, good news is we saw Secret Oath is actually going to be coming back for a four-year-old campaign. Uh, she was pulled off of the uh, sales block at Keeneland, so she is going to be coming back as a four-year-old for another campaign. She, I thought she ran actually a pretty, pretty strong distaff. I hope she gets a little bit of time off, but I think she's she ran a much better race than I think some of us anticipated. And listen, this is the new normal for the sport. Aiden O'Brien retired Blackbeard at two years old. Flightline retires after six career races. This is the way things are going to happen. Mo Donegal retired. Early voting retired. These are horses that they're just going to start retiring early. And it's for a variety of reasons. Some of it has to do with stud fees. Some of it has to do, quite frankly, with breeding in terms of the durability of these horses and what they're bred to do and what they're capable of handling. And the fact that we're, we seem to be breeding more and more delicate horses and more and more fragile horses over time. There's so much money in the back end of the horse racing industry in terms of the sire and stud and broodmare fees. Just saw Pizza Bianca sold for $3.4 million at the Keeneland sale. So this is, there's so much money tied up on both the colts and horses as well as the fillies and mares that this is the new normal. And I compared it to the other day to someone I said, being a horse racing fan is becoming like being a fan of a double a baseball team in that you only get to see those players come through your little minor league system for a couple of years until they get promoted to the next level in the big leagues. And so as a fan of a minor league baseball, you get used to not getting too connected to horses or well, not in horses for baseball, but you get used to not connecting to people because you know, next year they're going to be gone already. Two years are going to be gone for sure. And we are sadly getting the same way with horses where we don't get connected to them because we know they're only going to be around for six races. They're only going to be around for a year or two. And then there's going to be a new face coming up. Now it doesn't mean we don't get excited for them. We always do, but it's changing the nature of the sport. So those are five lessons that we learned from the weekend. We're going to come back with a whole lot of post-Breeders' Cup analysis for the rest of the week. Make sure to like and subscribe this video. Make sure to subscribe to Trust the Profits. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at the handle at Failed to Menace. And remember to check out our sponsor, Play Up Racebook. If you sign up and deposit at Play Up Racebook, you will receive a 50% deposit bonus for up to $250. 
Well, thank you again for all of your support during this Breeders' Cup coverage. We are so appreciative of it here at Trust the Profits. Personally, I cannot thank any, all of you enough. And until next time, friends, my name is Matthew DeSantis, wishing you a great and prosperous day at the races and reminding you that it's now post time.